deeply entrenched and memorialized in most, if not all, of the former colonial towns and cities of South Africa. Now, that quote, uh, according to Tando Sipuye, after his visit to the Karoo town of Hrafrenet in the Eastern Cape for the burial of Dinile Sizwe Sobukwe a few weeks ago. And he also observed uh, the glaring absence of the media at the funeral of Dini Sobukwe, who was, of course, the son of the founder of the Pan-Africanist Congress, Robert Sobukwe. Uh, Tando Sipuye uh, is an African-centered historian and also a social scientist and joins us here in studio and uh, welcoming in Cape Town uh, we have Lucanio Galata journalist and author of the book My Father Died for This and he's the son of Fort Galata who was one of the Craddock Four murdered by the apartheid government to both of you thanks so much for coming through thank you so much for having me so thank let's you. start here Tando I want to start with you talking about what is happening in a town like Graf Reynet uh, following the um, uh, burial of Dini Sobukwe. What did you expect to see in Graf Reynet? Um, well, certainly I, I think that, uh, Sakina, that uh, what I saw in Graf Reynet is in fact what I expected to see. Because um, towns such as Graf Reynet continue, like I stated uh, in the article that I wrote, they continue to be outposts um, of racism, white supremacy. And what I speak about there is the structure you know, the structure of the society is still largely uh, divided against two worlds. You can, as you enter through the town of Raf Reynet, you can see um, the suburb community, the town and so forth. And then as you enter right through past the town of Raf Reynet, they are the townships of Umasizake and the nearby are the townships. And um, these townships are struck with a uh, poverty you can see how wretched um, the communities are right there. And then right in the center, you can see where the white enclave is, totally removed, far removed from um, the rest of the community. But like I'm saying also, th there was nothing surprising for me because these towns, Graf Reynet specifically, is um, one of the oldest uh, colonial magis ma magistra magistrate territorial districts in the country. Um, and in fact, one of the things what, that I saw when I was in Graf Reynet was a monument um, which was dedicated to the founding of um, the Union of South Africa in 1910. And you would understand that um, after the anglo boer War, the English and the Dutch settlers came together and formed a union government, excluding the indigenous population uh, in this country. And uh, in 1910, on the 31st of May, they established a government at the Union Buildings. Um, and um, like I'm saying, this was a racist settler colonial government which excluded uh, African people. And then in 1910, 1912, the African National Congress was formed to protest as a form of protest against uh, this illegitimate settler uh, government. So what I'm saying, in fact, is that the structure of racism, very often when we speak about racism, we focus on the happenings in the big cities, in the towns, and um, what we see in the news media and so forth. But there are small little enclaves such as Graf Reynet, towns such as Cradock, uh, your King Williamstown and so forth. And what is interesting also about these towns is that they are named after uh, people who might consider to be criminals and murderers people who raped and killed and maimed African people in this country. And uh, there is absolutely no reason why we, sh we still should be having a country, I mean a town, named after General de Graaf, for example, or Cradock, for example, you know, and many others, General de Eben. These are murderers, colonial murderers, people who committed genocide in this country. Mm. And, and, and uh, just to move to uh, Lucanio in uh, Cape Town. Lucanio, uh, I would imagine, because I saw you nodding as um, Tando was speaking, with regard to Craddock, uh, has the situation there changed much as well? And also, again, uh, perhaps not quite asking whether you expected to see something different, but did you expect something to be done, given that we do have very prominent freedom fighters coming from these towns? Sakina, yes, indeed. I mean, I agree to some extent with Utando, uh, particularly when he talks about 
the names of the current the, the names of these towns in question. Um, you know, I think we've had 25 years of a democracy, and that is enough time in which certain towns should have been renamed by now, not just the big cities such as Makanda or or. or, or Koa or something like that, but we need to have towns, significant towns like Ravrinet, like Cradock, uh, renamed, uh, you know, towards, to reflect the, the, the black people who are in that town, whose history uh, lays in those towns. Uh, I disagree with him, however, on this issue of... Um, the the the, the, fa the fact that you know that the, that these towns are enclaves i think you know we can't really continue to blame uh, the white community for trying to look after themselves in in those towns and trying to survive when in a town like Craddock, for instance the majority of the last 25 years, it has been governed by an ANC government. And it should have been the ANC government that puts the interest of the black and the colored communities in my town at the forefront and try to raise their level to, to, to the level of the white community. So uh, I, I, th I think that we, we really do need to be careful as to how we deal with that situation. Uh, thirdly, Sakina, the issue that you ask about whether or not there should have been action. Hraflinet is Robert Sobukwe's town. Kradok is, in my understanding, the town of Reverend James Tralad uh, and the Kradok Four. And I think that a lot should have been done in those two towns in memory of these struggle stalwarts to make sure that the communities from which they come, the communities that they served, should have been uh, raised, should have been assisted, should have been helped to make sure that, that, they, that they feel that they had contributed towards the struggle and, and, and towards the liberation of our country. So what would you say then, Tando, uh, to South Africans watching this program who come from towns other than these towns, perhaps who haven't delivered any uh, insignificant people, freedom fighters for that matter, and they say, so why should we care? Why should a town like Hrafrenet or a town like Craddock or, you know, any other town that has delivered uh, some of our stalwarts, why should they receive special treatment for development when the rest of us are just getting the RDP houses and everything that everyone else is getting? Why should these towns be treated differently? Um, certainly, these towns should not be treated differently. But what I'm speaking about here is about extending, um, you know, our terrain of uh, taking care of our people. And um, you know very well, Sakina, that very often when we, when we speak about development and so forth, it is largely centered around, you know, the big cities, whether you're talking about your Johannesburg, your Deben, or your Cape Town, and you largely focus on the townships, the big townships, your Soweto mainly, for example, your Alexandra and so forth. But what I'm saying is that there are communities which remain silenced Communities which remain uh, erased from our national discourse, and uh, for f and I mean, for example, when I wrote that article, I received numerous um, responses from people in different other towns, like Rafrenet, like Craydog, like King Williamstown, and so forth. People, one of one which caught my attention was a lady who said to me, "I can breathe for the first time." Because this is what is actually happening in these, uh, in these uh, communities. But People continue to be remain silenced and erased and uh, unrecognized. Their stories remain untold but, and but unacknowledged. But I want to call you on that because what do you, rem uh, what do you mean when you say people remain silenced? How are people in small towns different in terms of the agency that they possess as individuals, as communities, to bring about change for themselves? Mm. Why do you say they remain silenced? And who is silencing them then for that matter? You know, uh, Sakina, one of the challenges that we have in uh, post-1994 South Africa is that we tend to tell history largely and narrative, our approach to narrative is largely from a, a singular uh, trajectory. And um, what I'm saying is that uh, no agency is taken from the people. The people continue to voice themselves. For example, I was in Hlafrenet, 
I saw various activities and programs that people are engaged in within their community to try and change their own conditions. But what I'm saying is that, like uh, Lukanyo was saying, there is no um, assistance or recognition of these communities, particularly from those in power. You know, the ruling uh, elites and the oligarchs. And part of the challenge with these um, uh, towns, such as Hrafrinet, for example, from where I stand, is that um, Hrafrinet is a town of Sobukwe, like he said. People such as Sobukwe are people who are largely erased from our uh, memory and, and public discourse and national consciousness. They are largely silenced. And so what I'm saying is that what Sobukwe represents it falls down, it trickles down to the community, his people and so forth. Like I'm saying, for example, I was in Hrafreinet, I was at the burial and the memorial service of uh, Mr. Sobukwe. There was nothing that was reported on this. It, uh, he, was, he, did not, he was not seen as someone who had any sort of currency. You mm. know, he was not seen as someone who, you know, was important in our public discourse. But like you know, in this country and throughout the African continent, we have one of uh, the challenges that are facing us is the emergence of uh, political dynasties as well as business uh, dynasties. Okay. You know. I want to bring Lucanio in on that matter as well because uh, talking to the people and as Tando mentions, you would think, you would expect that, um, you know, the exuberance, the vibrancy and uh, just the astuteness of those leaders who come from those towns would have somehow filtered through, seeped through, found its way through to the roots in those communities. But if these towns remain largely unchanged 25 years into democracy, um, is it simply because these people have been erased from our history that they haven't seen much change? I mean, surely people can do more than that because nobody's going to hand anything to you, Tando. You've got to take mm -hmm. it. Lucanio? Sakina, I agree with you to a very large extent. However, <clears throat> the, between 1984 and 1985, the community of Lingelitle in Kredok was the only, only community in this entire country that managed to unshackle itself, that managed to free itself from the grip of apartheid. The, the, at the time, the apartheid government had this phrase for it, that Kredok had successfully implemented an alternative structure of governance, which means that the people of my town were governing themselves between, particularly from January 1985 to, 19, to June 1985 when my father and, and, and Matthew Goni were Sparum Konto and Strelum Klaule were killed. So for those six months, Kredok was free. They, it was a liberated zone. Those people there, they, they governed themselves. So what then happened was when, when the Kredok Four were taken out, when they, when they were killed, it left a community unable to move forward. When the TRC came in 1996, and then when they finished the work in 1998, they had made certain recommendations, one of which uh, dealt with the issue of community rehabilitation. Now, earlier this year at Open News, where I work, we did um, an interview with the former Minister of Justice, Michael Masuta, and I was flabbergasted when he actually admitted to us, live on air, that they as a government, as the ANC government, had actually failed when it comes to the issue of community rehabilitation. Now that tells you a lot about the state in which those communities, communities that were left deeply traumatized by some of the atrocities of apartheid, and how the ANC government had actually then failed to assist them. One of the longest uh, school boycotts took place in Kredok. So for a, from 1984 right all the way up until 1989 when the state of emergency was then ended, there were young men and women in Kredok who did not go to school for up to five years 
because they did the boycott up until 85 and then they were arrested uh, from July onwards uh, all the way to 1989. So they, they never had schooling. So these people are now parents who are sitting in Craddock without any education, without any skills to actually make a living. And yet the government has the audacity to come and admit that they had failed when it comes to the issue of community rehabilitation. Who then do we blame in an instance like that? Now, I'd love for you to answer that question. We're out of time, but I'm going to give each of you literally 30 seconds to tell us where does the solution lie? How do people in these small towns try and reverse this tide and, and, and try and unshackle themselves of those chains of apartheid that still remain intact in most of our small towns? Lukanya, let's start with you. Sakina, I think it's important for people to realize who they are, where they come from, and for them to regain their agency. Because it's become abundantly clear over the last 25 years that the ANC is not interested in acting in their interests. And people and communities need to realize that they need to reclaim their power. Tando? I think that it had been said that um, the people shall govern. And I think what Lukanya is saying, the people must reclaim their power power to change their own material conditions on the ground. And I think that um, people such as Mr. Dini Sobukwe had assisted uh, the community of Rafrenet because he is one of the people who established the Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe uh, Learning Center and Museum there to try and change the conditions of the people. And so people must reclaim their power uh, to assert themselves and to change their own conditions. Well, thank you so much to uh, Tando Sipuye and Lukanyo Kalata for stimulating discussion, talking to us about uh, both uh, the present and the past and about what needs to be done to change the face and also the conditions of people living in small towns where it seems in certain instances that time has literally stood still and that not much has changed since the apartheid years. Let us know your views at Morning Live SABC and you can use the hashtag Morning Live as well. It's 8 o'clock, time for your